This week, Jeff Orloff from RangeForce is with us to discuss optimizing the human element of cybersecurity. Then Paul Roberts from the Security Ledger joins us to talk about why our right to repair is critical to securing the Internet of Things. Finally, in enterprise security news, this week more layoff announcements than funding announcements, and CRIT is acquired by Gray Noise. Incident response in AWS is different. Awesome, some awesome open source projects for SecOps folks. Tyler Shields also can't wait to talk about product led growth, forcing open source maintainers to use MFA. Twilio, the breach that keeps on growing. <laughs> The U.S. government earmarks $15.6 billion for cybersecurity, and we hear vendors salivating already. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. The shift to remote and hybrid work over the past two years has accelerated application development on cloud infrastructure. However, securing these new assets has lagged behind. Qualys CloudView, the next generation of cloud security posture management, delivers an end-to-end -end multi cloud security and compliance solution encompassing the entire application lifecycle from build to runtime. CloudView enables enterprises to assess their cloud security and compliance posture, identify risks and gaps, auto-remediate issues, proactively enforce best practices, and prove compliance in audits rapidly and efficiently. Identify your most vulnerable cloud assets by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys. Managing and protecting the world's grueling number of endpoints, enabling Tanium's customers to see, control, and protect every endpoint everywhere. Tanium's mission is to provide certainty in uncertain times with the industry's only converged endpoint management. Trusted by the U.S. military and the majority of the Fortune 100, Tanium helps manage and protect nearly 30 million endpoints. Tanium, the power of certainty. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Tanium to learn more. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy National Burnt Ends Day. This is episode 287, recorded on Thursday, September 1st of 2022. I am your guest host for this week, Joe South. And joining me is Tyler Shields. How are you, Tyler? Good, Joe. How are you doing today? You know, it burnt ends is my least favorite part of the barbecue. A am I crazy in saying that? What do you think? I wouldn't say that I prefer it. I don't go to restaurants and order it. It's like the hottest thing in Texas, though, right? Like down there, everybody's like, "How good are the burnt ends at that at that barbecue joint?" Apparently, I'll I'll be there next week. I'll find out. I'll report back. I expect I definitely expect some kind of email or DM or something explained explaining to me your experience with burnt ends in Texas. I'll be sure to go in depth. Also joining me is Katie Teitler. How are you, Katie? I am well. I am well. I don't eat burnt ends and we don't have good barbecue here in boston so i am envious of your texas barbecue <laughs> finally we have tyler robinson is joining us as well today how are you tyler i am fantastic i'm gonna say burnt ends are probably the barbecue's marketing best effort like we burn a bunch of ends and we sell them for a higher <laughs> price this is fantastic good idea <laughs> So burnt ends this is, is the, the buzzword of barbecue. It is. It's the stuff that we <laughs> normally wouldn't serve you, but we'll charge you more for it. Brilliant. Right. Well, before we get into the interview, I have one quick announcement. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for a guest by visiting securityweekly.com slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly and will reach out to you once reviewed. This interview is sponsored by RangeForce. Today's topic is optimizing the human element of cybersecurity. We are excited to have Jeff Orloff, technical evangelist and VP of product at RangeForce with us today. Jeff has a background in security and as a system admin. Welcome to the show, Jeff. 
Thanks very much. And, uh, you know, I got I got to love that uh, that take on the burnt ends there, the marketing piece. So I'm going to try and avoid any buzzwords in this uh, conversation today just to, to, to respect that. <laughs> well, what's your opinion on burnt ends? You can't dodge this question. I, well, I am in Florida. I do get to visit Texas every now and then. Um, I, I do like them, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not one that's going to uh, go out and, and seek out like the best burnt ends in Austin or something like that. Uh, no sense in waiting in line for something that, uh, like you said, is you know kind of like the leftover that they're charging extra for. So, right, I'd rather wait for whiskey personally. But uh, today we're talking about security training and. You know, when I when I think of security training, the first thing that comes to mind is phishing tests and the security training that you basically do as a new employee at every company, right? Don't click on links, don't send money to people that uh, you don't know or that you haven't confirmed need that money. What are we missing? Because I feel like there's a huge part to this that even as security professionals, we're probably missing. Yeah, absolutely. Um... You know, I, I spent a good portion of my career in that in that space, and you know, I think we did a great job when I was when I was with um, with the company doing more of the cybersecurity awareness training of uh, of really kind of promoting the importance of that human layer of security. And what you see now is we've kind of developed tunnel vision around the end user and really focusing on making sure they understand what to do if they see something out of sorts. That's great um, for you know for most organizations, but it, what I, what I'm starting to see, and I think a lot of others are seeing, is that what we're what we've done is start to ignore the folks who are who are actually responding to a lot of these threats and a lot of these attacks. So you know, kind of um, that those training dollars are moving away from the cybersecurity professionals. We develop that tunnel vision around cybersecurity awareness. So you know. In our, in our minds, we're like, oh, if enough people are reporting those phishing emails, we should be good. But what about the people who have to triage those and deal with those phishing emails or, you know, investigate what's going on afterwards? And, and that's really what we try and do at RangeForce is develop the skills and and enable those, um, those folks who are on the other, the receiving end of all those reports, those logs and those investigations and help them build their skills up so that they can detect uh, those attacks and those threats faster. Let me let me ask you a question around that. Do you, do you actually think that security awareness training is effective and needed in today's industry? And to follow on to that is, should we be expecting our end users to actually detect the kind of phishing and and social engineering that's actually happening from any mediocre level sophisticated actor today? Like. I 100% agree. We are. I'm actually working an incident right now, and the people that needed to know, the people that got the the fish, are going to do what they do because it was a good fish. The people that need the resources and need the time and training are the people I'm working with, and they don't have any of that. So, are any of the security awareness initiatives that we've been pushing for so long are they all in vain now? And should we be moving to something different? I think as you as you get people more conditioned and more understanding of the need to report, the need to um, just kind of like be that eyewitness. If you if you compare it to like a criminal investigation or you know something that um, like the police or, or someone are looking at, anyone who can report that um, it, it gives them that that kind of um, eyewitness approach to it. So it gives it gives those analysts more uh, more evidence and more information to work off of so I, I definitely think that you know if you're if you're doing the right things when it comes to security awareness training it, it can be helpful for those analysts um but again um you know I, I'd agree with you there it's what are we doing on that next uh that next phase of that investigation and how are we helping prepare those people to to do their jobs um you know one one of the things I I had a conversation with uh, with some folks the other day about this, and one of the issues that they had is they see like not only the threat landscape changing so quickly, and their analysts not being able to keep up there, but even the tools and the technology that they're using. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of money on some great solutions to, you know, to analyze logs with to capture uh, information, capture logs. 
not enough people are trained or skilled on how to use those effectively. So, you know, a lot of times we see that collecting dust in those, um, you know, well, you know, I'll, I'll kind of tip off my age there on those, you know, those, uh, those racks, but, um, you know, even the, the cloud technologies, we see those things sitting um, oftentimes under use because folks don't have the skills on what to do with them. Does that does that fall to the vendor though? Is that a vendor solution or implementation problem where these vendors are, are either not providing enough support or good documentation or training, or vendors such as Microsoft? Like I love Microsoft to death and I love Ho 365, but I'm gonna I'm gonna vent on them today because even the stuff I know how to go get logs, what I'm looking for, and how I want to see that. I can't even find it in there because they've changed the name, they've changed the location, they've changed how you do the query. They've even changed the the PowerShell backend command lines in order to obtain the logs just necessary to do the analysis. So how do we expect our our analysts that are doing IT work every day to be up to speed when an incident happens and be able to find what they need when everything changes? So does this fall on the vendor? I think some of it it's um you know, we, we've looked at training for so long as um, either, you know, reading the manual or, you know, watching a video or, or, or you know, something like that. And I think really when, when it comes down to it, you, you want to build transferable knowledge in people so that it's not, it's not so much the interface or, you know, where to click the button or, or where to, to get the log from, because those are things that I think the vendors can do well and those are quick to pick up on. It's more of the capability of that analyst and giving them that knowledge and practice really um, in dealing with an incident and in responding to things, because then it, it, it goes along the old adage of it's, it's no longer the tool that's important, it's the actual person who's using it. Um, and that's where that hands-on concept of actually using those tools in practice is so important. Um, you know, one of the one of the analogies I like to use, I, I spent years coaching um, football here in Florida uh, early in my career. And, you know, we would have we would have kids that would come in, athletes that just they looked the apart. They did amazing in drills and everything. And it wasn't until we put them into like a live uh, scrimmage that you could really find out who could who could um, who could be your starters and who could play and who, who was, you know, who needed work still. And that's where that hands-on experience is so important in that that true live fire um, drill, because you you if you haven't experienced it before, if you haven't had any work with it, it's really hard to to jump into any tool, whether it's one that you've you know you've completed all the vendor training or even um, you know earned a vendor certificate on, and actually do your job with it, because a lot of that again a lot of that training is geared more towards how to use the tool and not how to understand the skill of what you're doing there. So Jeff, uh, you know, I think that we kind of dove into this a little bit without knowing what Rangeforce does. So what does Rangeforce do to kind of fill this gap? Are they coming into an environment and staging attacks and making it all, you know, look real and whatnot, and you're doing it several times a year or something like that? And training up the uh the analysts to be able to identify and react to it so we take two approaches at range force the first one is our is our individual skills trainer and that that's an on-demand um training platform that really allows you know our customers to go in and complete modules that take anywhere between 15 to 35 minutes um and really learn and and challenge themselves in some of those skills um for instance, you can go in and, and use any one, any number of different sims, but you know, learning how to build um, queries, um, how to search, sift through logs with that, how to build uh, alerts, and and like, um, you can even then take that and apply it to different strains of of malware, different ransomware um, samples that we have built in there. So learning how to detect, uh, how to disrupt those attacks, and then how to defend your organization against them is is all part of that and again like i said that is on demand so people can access that in a cloud-based environment that spins up those those virtual machines and those virtual environments you know from their home or, or anywhere they want 
On top of that, we have what we call our um, team threat exercises. And that takes all of those skills that the individuals are learning and, and putting into practice every day. And that's where we, we really have that, um, that true scrimmage game, like I was talking about, where your teams can get together and participate in responding to an actual incident um, as a group. So it, it's, um, it kind of takes that reverse of a capture the flag and um, some of those traditional cyber ranges and and makes it more about that um, that team effort there. So what we don't do is um, is make it that competition. We make it a an effort to see how well that team is working together to respond to that incident. Um, and, and what we found is really important there is um, those soft skill measurements that you can't really get in a lot of the other um, training platforms where you know you can see if someone is able to to use a certain tool if they're able to um, find indicators of compromise for any strain of malware but the ability to communicate um, the leadership skills and you know just even that collaboration that, that goes on when a team is working on an incident together are things that um, that that team threat exercise really turns up and we've seen that that's really powerful for those um for those uh sock leaders and and some of those um you know, higher ops like the CISOs and the like. Huh. Does, so that's really interesting. Uh, sorry, Tyler, you can go ahead. No, I, I was just curious. So from from that standpoint and, and the interaction you've seen doing this on enterprises and working with teams, do you find that the enterprises are allocating the necessary time to develop those teams after the training, after you do the assessment? Is it part of the ongoing... Uh, overall assessment where you can develop and, and further their their learning or provide insights into next steps and roadmaps for the team? Yeah, I, I love the, the term roadmap because that's exactly what we kind of um, talk to our, our users about. So once they're done with that that um, team threat exercise, our, our teams will hand off an after action report. It'll kind of highlight some of the good, um, some of the not so good that they saw with those teams, areas for improvement, but really giving them that, that roadmap or playbook for how to upskill for the next one. So how to move that needle from, you know, where you're at here to where you want to be at as an organization. And we, that's really the most important part because, um, you know, a lot of times when you, when you look at training, it's kind of, uh, looking at that that large catalog of content you know we look at some of these other different types of training offerings and you have people going through saying well you know how how much do you have how many how many different modules or how many different lessons do you have and that becomes that magic number when it goes through procurement of well you know more must be better because we can get more training in there and we're not looking at it from that practical standpoint of you know if you just turn people loose in something they're going to go find what might be interesting or you know, maybe get way out of their own depths on something and not um, taking that more strategic approach to cybersecurity and how your organization wants to kind of move the needle and, and, and accomplish some of those goals. And that that roadmap is just so essential in that because it helps it helps those administrators and it helps those people get from point A to point B. Um, a lot of times we also hear that, you know, there's no time to train. People are, you know, people are overloaded. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard plenty of times about how, um, you know, analysts are just are getting burned out because they're overloaded. Um, you know, some of their their uh, managers and, and directors even are just, um, you know, they're they're filling in those gaps personnel wise. They don't have time to build out that program, and and that's where we try to really help those uh, those customers out by using our expertise, our knowledge, and. And comparing a lot of that data that we have in the back end of our systems to really help them, you know, accomplish those goals and, and spend that time that they do have available for training and for skills development in the right way. Hmm. So that's really interesting. You know, we have a few minutes left for this segment, but Jeff, I'm really wondering if you could give us an example of a time when you took an, an organization's uh, maybe incident response time frame from several hours or days, you know, and and potentially you know decreased it, made it more optimized, and and trained up those those people better. 
I, I don't have anything I can share on that, but it, it does go back to a story that, um, that one of our one of our folks uses, and it's kind of one of those um, those very typical responses where the first time they saw um, a particular strain of, of ransomware, or I'm sorry, particular strain of malware. It took 30 some hours um, for that investigation to run its course and everything. So, you know, they, they got the obligatory pizza and everything sent over to their team. Um, and everyone worked through the night on that. A couple of months later, they saw the same thing. This time, the investigation was, was cut down to about six hours because they had that experience with it already. So they ran through the whole investigation. One shift was able to take care of it and deal with it. Come to the third time, 15 minutes, start to finish, everything was, was completed. And the way that they tell that story is it's it's because of the experience they had going through it. Some of the things had shifted. You know, there were a couple of indicators of compromise that were different. Some of the, um, the payload was a little bit different. And those things had been modified, but they had enough experience with that particular strain of malware and enough experience in investigating that, that they were able to trim that down and you know, I mean, it's not only the savings on the pizza, but it's just the, the stress and um, and really allowing people to focus on other things, cutting that from 30 plus hours down to 15 minutes, you know, was was huge. And that's really what we try and do for our customers is is give them that ability to um, to practice in their downtime, practice in their off time so that when um, when it does, you know, when, when something bad does happen in their their organization, it's not the first time they're dealing with it or the first time they're seeing it. You know, it gives them that level of confidence that they can they can address the threat head on, and it, it also gives them that confidence that they're not going to break their tools or you know they're not going to shut down their sim or, or something like that by accident or clicking the wrong button or something. Yeah, it sounds uh, extremely valuable that I wish I had earlier on in my career for sure. Well, Jeff, thank you for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And make sure you visit securityweekly.com slash rangeforce to learn more. Stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to talk right to repair and securing IoT with Paul Roberts from the Security Ledger.